Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm Kelsey Chandler, the local history librarian. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Wayne County Public Library. Wayne County Public Library received an American Rescue Plan Humanities Grant from North Carolina Humanities, which has funded this program. Funding for this grant was provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the American Rescue Plan Act Economic Stabilization Plan. We would like to extend thanks to this initiative, the Wayne Community College Foundation, and our community partners, including Jewish Heritage and Sea, the Wheel family, for their assistance in making this program possible. Mr. David Wheel is going to introduce our speaker. Good evening. Yes, there is a Jewish temple in Goldsboro, and we have a book to prove it. When I was a youngster, we had a large population. Uh, we could fill the temple, but the temple now is the local soup kitchen, which we think is a good use for the building. There are no longer enough Jewish people to justify having a temple, and that is part of what the story a story that will be told to you this evening. Dr. Leonard Rogoff is no stranger to Goldsboro. He spoke, he, he's spoken here several times in the past. Dr. Rogoff has taught at the University of North Carolina, North Carolina Central, and Duke. He's the former president of the Southern Jewish Historical Society and is the recipient of its Lifetime Achievement Award. He's lectured widely and contributed to numerous journals and anthologies. He now serves as historian and president of the Jewish Heritage North Carolina. His books include Down Home, Jewish Life in North Carolina, and Gertrude Wheel, a Jewish progressive in the New South, which was the winner of the 2017 North Carolina Historical and Literary Association's Reagan Old North State Award. I present to you Dr. Leonard Rogoff. Thank you. I, first, I want to thank uh, David and, and Emily Wheel and Kelsey Chandler for your hospitality and graciousness and the invitation to speak tonight. Uh, North Carolina was really not thought to have a Jewish history, which is relative to uh, Virginia and South Carolina, which had Jewish communities dating to colonial days. If we look at the population statistics, we see as a percentage, North Carolina has had about the smallest percentage of Jews of uh, any state in the country, though not in absolute numbers, and it is only until very relatively recently that the numbers have really become significant. That is not to say that Jews were not here from the start. In 1585, on Sir Walter Raleigh's second expedition to Roanoke Island, uh, there was one Jew, the metallurgist and scientist uh, for the expedition, Joachim Gantz, a native of Prague who'd immigrated to England. Uh, there was a little in this particular uh, area to draw Jews. Um, again, you know, uh, this area that became Wayne County was primarily field and forest. North Carolina had a swampy coast. There was no port, no Charleston. And when the Constitution was written in seven, the state Constitution was written in 1776, religious liberty was granted, but then they put in a constitutional religious test that said you had to be a believer in the truth of the Protestant religion in order to hold public office. Um, so there were other areas more inviting to Jews. Jews are, uh, the Jewish migration to America is usually explained in terms of three waves, which sort of works. From the 1600s to the 1820s was the Spanish, Portuguese, or Sephardic Jewish wave. These were refugees from the Spanish and Portuguese Inquisition who had made their way to Holland and England and some to the uh, uh, Caribbean and Latin America, and they worked their way up north. Uh, though by the 1730s, a majority were Ashkenazi, or German Jews. Uh, only by, uh, by 1820, there were only 2,500 Jews in America. Uh, the larger migration of about 150,000 Jews, and this is the migration that established the Goldsboro Jewish community, uh, came, uh, arrived um, from 1820 to 1880, particularly after the failed revolutions, liberal revolutions of 1848. And then from the 1880s to the 1920s was the East European wave from Russian and Polish lands, uh, again, of two and a half million Jews, which was 
uh, and most Jews, um, about 80% of them, 80 to 90% are descended from this particular migration. As I said, there wasn't really a lot to bring them uh, to this particular area. It consisted mostly of farm communities. The Neuse River was really not, not ne <coughs> negotiable. Jews were an urban and commercial people. Uh, and North Carolina in the antebellum years was named, nicknamed the Rip Van Winkle State. Uh, it was asleep, it was losing population. That changed in 1835 with a new constitution uh, and the state embarked on a program of internal improvements, and we started to see railroad constructions. In the 18, uh, um, again, if we look at the history of migration to uh, North Carolina, we did have a very, very small uh, Spanish-Portuguese migration. Uh, most of these people, Aaron Lopez, a wealthy merchant in Rhode Island, sent about uh, 40 ships to, uh, along the North Carolina coast, and he had members of his family as agents. So we see a presence in these port cities. But coming inland is really the German migration that establishes uh, these communities. What pushed them to America? Well, poverty, uh, anti-Semitic uh, legislation, uh, tax Jews into, into poverty. Uh, they were restricted in the occupations they could pursue. They were not permitted to join the guilds. Um, they were, uh, their residences were confined to certain areas. In some, some of the principalities of Germany, they, only the oldest son could marry. Uh, and after the failed revolutions of 1848, which held, had held out the hope of uh, Jewish liberation and citizenship, uh, there was a large migration started from southern Germany, from Bavaria and Württemberg. A Jewish writer spoke of an addiction to America. Uh, the immigrants would receive letters from family members who had uh, come to America urging them to come. They read newspaper accounts. And this was a stage migration. First, they are settled in the port cities of New York or Philadelphia. Uh, and especially for the southern Jews, Baltimore became the first place of residence. In 1850, there were 700 Jews in Baltimore. By 1901, there were 35,000. And ships that carried cotton and tobacco from Baltimore returned with, the, returned with these refugees, uh, immigrants. And about a quarter of them settled in the heartland of, North, of, of, of America. Uh, what pulled them south? Well. In North Carolina, they found a place pretty much like the place they had left behind. These Jews were what they called Dorfjuden. They were village Jews. They'd lived in rural towns where they peddled or they had stores. And they were middlemen between city and country. By 1841, um, we find that there were 48 North Carolina towns with Jewish stores. And we have evidence from records that we see of Jewish peddlers in this area. Uh, Lipman Aaron, Moses Einstein, um, the Bloomingdale brothers had stores uh, peddled around here. It had a store in Face and Corner. Uh, they didn't succeed, and they went up to New York, and I guess they had better luck on Third Avenue with a Bloomingdale's department store. But uh, we also had a, in, in downtown Gold, in Goldsboro by 1850, Falk Odenheimer had a store. Isaac and Henry Ettinger of Baltimore were down here uh, 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 peddling. Uh, Asher Urbanski had partnered, had a French partner on, by the name of Edward. Uh, when uh, Edward, uh, the, when the Frenchman Edward left, uh, Urbanski took over the peddler's license and he became uh, Asher, Asher Edwards uh, and they would establish themselves in Goldsboro. When we look at the R.G. Dunn credit reports, if a uh, peddler were a Jew, it was uh, almost invariably noted, often with very prejudicial remarks, such as, Jew hawks or peddles goods with a wagon. Such men are always regarded with distrust here. In 1857, the storekeeper at Falk Odenheimer got into a dispute with uh, a Dr. John Davis. Uh, they wound up in court. Um, Davis's nephew uh, hit Odenheimer with a shovel, fracturing his skull. Uh, um, uh, Odenheimer's son-in-law shot, uh, <laughs> fired a gun and, and I guess shot Davis. Both men survived, but the new, uh, unfortunately a man by the name of Hal, a Quaker, 
uh, prevented a lynch mob from gathering to, uh, uh, to lynch Odenheimer, and they said all the Jews left town. This was in 1857, but it couldn't have been too much of an incident because it was the, a year or two later, the Wheels and the Endlers uh, uh, settled in Goldsboro, and um, uh, the, the Dunn Credit Reports describe them as men of, quote, strict integrity, very energetic and enterprising. If you want to see where Jews are settling, follow the railroad. Uh, in the 1840s, the Wilmington to Weldon Railroad was built, which was the longest railroad in the world, where uh, the railroad crossed the uh, New Bern Road. Uh, it, was a little, it was a transportation hub, a hotel arose, some buildings, uh, and a, a town grew. Uh, it was incorporated as Goldsboro, which was symbolically named after a railroad engineer in 1847 and became the county seat, which also brought people to town. Uh, in the 1850s, as we can tell from this very famous photo, um, the um, North Carolina Railroad was built from Goldsboro all the way across the state to Carborough, and uh, uh, to Charlotte, rather. Um, and you, you'll see right here, by the way, here is the H. Wheel and Brothers store, and we know there are a couple of other Jewish stores by then. And um, this commerce uh, resulted in the beginnings of, uh, of the mill and market towns across North Carolina. Durham Station had just been a little uh, farming community and a, a tobacco factory opened and textile mills. Same thing happened in, in Greensboro. The village turned into a, a city. High Point was named because it was the highest point on the railroad. Uh, so again, uh, now all of a sudden, um, uh, farmers could bring produce in, it gave rise to commercial agriculture, warehouses grew. Uh, in the city of Charlotte, for example, in 1850 had nine Jews, by uh, 1860 it had 57. Uh, this was a family chain migration. Um, the famous uh, Jewish historian Rader, Jacob Rader Marcus said, uh, no Jew was ever the first to come to a community. He was always preceded by his uncle. Uh, and this was really the, uh, the way the, the Wheel family came. Uh, Henry Ettinger, as I said, was a Baltimore pet oiler who, who worked eastern North Carolina. He married Janet Wheel in Baltimore. Uh, Ettinger opened a store in Goldsboro uh, about 1859 or so, and he sent his brother-in-law, Herman, uh, down. Uh, Herman here, uh, and um, um, the, as I said, there were a number of other Jewish stores here, the Einsteins, who had stores in Kinston and Goldsboro. Uh, the wheels are start intermarrying with the Einsteins, and, and uh, then uh, Emil Rosenthal comes, his wife is a Nettinger. Uh, so there was a clans form, the wheels, Ettingers, Rosenthal's, Einstein, Spears, all these early German Jewish families were all related in even ways that they themselves could not figure out. And uh, um, cousin marriage was very uh, common. Uh, I discovered, that, for example, one case where uh, one of the wheels' uh, um, uh, sister-in-law was also his aunt. Uh, they became very intertwined. And, and uh, family and business also were intertwined. Uh, you would get supplier, supplies would be sent from a relative who had a store or a, or a warehouse or a distrib distribution center up in Baltimore or New York or Boston. They clerked in each other's stores. They financed each other in their enterprises. Um, and again, we see evidence of early Jewish settlers. Uh, those are uh, Henry Wheel and Herman Wheel up on the top there, ML and uh, Eva Ettinger uh, Rosenthal, um, and there's their daughter um, uh, Mina Rosenthal, who will marry one of the wheels. We see the, the laymen's have liquor stores. Uh, the Jews didn't have the inhibition about alcohol of, of others and were very frequently in the liquor business. The Edwards were down here. They had a, a store also. Uh, the Strausses were a Baltimore family. So again, this was signs of, um, of Jewish enterprise. So we see a number, by the 1860s, a number of Jewish stores in Goldsboro. Where did Jews stand on the great issue of the day of slaveholding? Well, every study that's ever been done of Southern Jews shows that their slaveholding was no different than that of other whites. 
with the exception that very rarely were Jews um, uh, plantation owners. So if Jews would only own probably a household slave or maybe uh, one or two at work at most, but I found absolutely no evidence whatsoever of Jewish slaveholding uh, uh, in, in Goldsboro. Uh, here's a, a merchant, uh, a Jewish merchant up in Warrington. You can see he's selling his slaves, but they, they tend to be household slaves. Um, when the Civil War came, the Jews proved themselves to be loyal Confederates. They showed their appreciation for their new homes. Herman Weil had only been in America for three years, spoke fractured English, but he was among the first to join J.B. Whitaker's company in Goldsboro. Leopold Ettinger would be killed in battle. Uh, Mike Heinemann was another Confederate veteran. Uh, Emil Rosenthal was a member of the Home Guard and had a, um, was given, uh, appointed a quartermaster by Governor Vance. Uh, in the post-war years with slaves freed, the South was reconstructing its society and economy. Uh, the, in 1868, a new constitution still in effect eliminated the, uh, uh, the, the religious test that disqualified Jews from public office. Uh, Jews were welcome and wanted for their commerce in new capitals as society was rebuilding itself. Also, they wanted white immigration with slaves freed and granted citizenship, they wanted to redress the racial balance of the South. Um, and even though at this time, Jews were often racially suspect, increasingly Jews were regarded not as members of a religion, but as members of a race. And you'll see references in, this, in the literature at the time of, to the Hebrew race. Um, uh, this also era of coincides with increased Jewish migration not from southern Germany as, as in the uh, antebellum years, but from Prussia, which was the area of western Poland that had been ceded to Germany, uh, of Prussian and Posen Jews. In 1870, there were 300 Jews in North Carolina, estimated 300 Jews in North Carolina. 210 were born in German lands. Uh, um, by, um, uh, by 1880s, the Goldsboro Jews were half Bavarian, the older migration, half Prussian, and one-third native-born. Uh, Henry Wheel and his correspondents distinguish our crowd of Bavarian, Wartenberg, southern Jews, from the uh, Polakim, the Polish Jews, who were much more religiously orthodox. Um, more Jews, and, um, uh, uh, and as we see with the growth of the community, there's an expansion of Jewish uh, enterprise. The Wheel brothers uh, expand their store, uh, open a store, and they bring their brother Solomon to join them. Uh, Asher Edwards brings his brothers Lipman and Joseph. Uh, we see William Cohn, the butchers. Mike Heinemann has a liquor store and an eating saloon. Lowenberg's another liquor dealer in Goldsboro. Jay Weil, I'm not sure of his connection to the Wheel family, arrives from Wilmington. Ike Fuchler is dealing in furniture. Jews establish an economic niche. Uh, Ninety percent of the Jews in town are either merchants or clerks. Uh, with the population growth, and this is a pattern we see after every war, there's a religious revival. Uh, the 1870s are the birthright years of uh, institutional Judaism in America. Uh, a union of American Hebrew congregations is formed, trying to reunite unite all the synagogues in the United States. A Hebrew Union College opens, and we see uh, organization going on on the local level, too. And it's done according to a formula, uh, according to a prescription in the Talmud, first the cemetery, then the city. Well, what does that mean? Most of these communities had one dead Jew before they had 10 living ones. Uh, and um, the first thing they needed to do was to form a cemetery society, or Kever Kedisha, Holy Fellowship, as it's called in Hebrew, which took responsibility not only for the ritual burial of the dead, but also conducted uh, religious services, took care of social welfare, of transients and new arrivals in town. And we see this organization going on. The first Jewish organization institution in uh, North Carolina is the Wilmington Hebrew Cemetery of 1855. Then we start seeing a cemetery society forms in Charlotte in 1867, uh, as well as the Ladies Benevolent Society. 
1870 in Raleigh, 1874 in Durham, and then 1875 in Goldsboro. They buy a section of the Willowdale Cemetery. And a year after that, a Ladies Hebrew Assistance Society organizes. Uh, again, even before, when they wanted to hold religious services, usually it was done in someone's home, either in Goldsboro, Kinston, Wilson. Emil Rosenthal uh, was a very religious man, and he organized services. Uh, but the first instant, uh, well, the, uh, before the creation of the synagogue, uh, B'nai B'rith Lodges in the 1870s formed across uh, North Carolina, um, including in... Um, uh, in places like Tarboro, Wilmington, Charlotte, and in, in 1879 in Goldsboro. Um, the very first synagogue in North Carolina, which is still in use, is the Temple of Israel in, uh, uh, that was built in uh, 1876 in Wilmington. Uh, in 1883, Jews in Goldsboro and also in Statesville uh, or, uh, gather to create congregations in their towns. Um, and what did they do when they wanted to or create a, a synagogue? Well, they did what they ever always did. They looked to Baltimore. Uh, I always think of Baltimore as the Jewish capital of North Carolina, and Goldsboro was one of its colonies. So the Goldsboro, uh, Baltimore is where they went uh, to find a bride um, or to bury their dead before they had a local Jewish cemetery. It's where they got supplies and merchandise for their stores. It's where they had family. Uh, and many of the Bald uh, Goldsboro Jews, especially the Wheel family, were members of the Oheb Shalom uh, congregation, a synagogue in, in Baltimore. So they brought down the cantor uh, uh, or prayer leader, Alois Kaiser, from Baltimore to help them organize a congregation. And they named their congregation Oheb Shalom after the Baltimore congregation. They adopted the bylaws, the customs, the prayer books, the ritual of the Baltimore congregation. And in 1886, when they built their own synagogue, again, they replicated the uh, architecture, Romanesque revival architecture. Uh, if you look at the ark, the, which holds the Torah scrolls and um, um, in um, Baltimore and in Goldsboro, you'll see that they are very, very much alike. A synagogue in the South, especially, uh, was not just a place where Jews could gather and worship and be among their own people and observe their faith. It was also a Jewish church, and they are establishing their place uh, in the faith community of the town. Uh, when the Methodists and Roman Catholics had built their own church, Jews contributed to church building. This was considered a civic community duty. And Christians also contributed to the building of the synagogue. Uh, it was part of a city building boom. New mills were arising, schools and stores, and uh, the synagogue was part of this effort of, of, of uh, civic uh, of citizenship. Uh, when it was dedicated, a crowd of Christians and Jews gathered. They had a grand banquet. And little Edna Wheel, eight years old, delivered a speech, which I'm sure she didn't write. But it's really very important for what she says is this kind of dual pur purpose. Well, our beautiful city, Goldsboro, increases in wealth and refinement. May this edifice stand among its sister, sister churches as an evidence of the devotion of the he Hebrew community of Goldsboro to the truth of their faith, to Judaism, and of the regard for the reputation of their city. Uh, we're members of, uh, of, the, of the town, city of Goldsboro. So again, the synagogue is a Jewish church. They bring down uh, as their first, well, the, the, they had a series of rabbis until uh, Rabbi Julius Meyerberg arrived in the 1880s, and he would serve for 34 years. Uh, he was an interesting fellow. He was a Lithuanian of orthodox background, but he had attended a German university where he had been uh, educated in reform Judaism. At the time, to be a state-certified rabbi, you had to have a university degree. And he had first served in Statesville before coming to uh, Goldsboro. Um, the presence of Jews of a Jewish community in Goldsboro uh, is, a, is a sign of the rise of what was of, of a new South. Um, in 1886, uh, an Atlanta journalist, Henry Grady, 
delivered a very famous speech in which he called for a new South. Uh, Southern cities would become hives of activity. Uh, racial harmony would prevail. Uh, the South would make an economic uh, transformation from agriculture to industry. Uh, the South and North Carolina especially was struck by mill fever, a, a gospel of industry. And the rallying cry became, uh, bring the cotton, to the cotton mills to the cotton fields. From 1880 to 1890, the number of uh, mills in North Carolina quadrupled. The number of uh, mill workers rose nine times. Uh, country, flock, country folk flocked into the cities. Uh, industrialization leads to urbanization. And we start seeing uh, uh, cities uh, arising across the state and uh, cities create commercial opportunity um, that uh, is welcoming of Jews. Uh, and again, we can see the rise of towns and cities all across North Carolina in this era from 1880 to 1920. In 1880, there was one town, one city in North Carolina that had over 10,000 people. By um, 1880, there were, uh, I'm sorry, by 1920, there were six. Uh, Goldsboro's population rose from 3,286 to 11,296. By 1880, there were 147 Jews in the town. And Goldsboro was growing into a city. You can see that here. The Wheels built a three-story building. They expanded their, their stores. But you, and these are, uh, these are all during the era of uh, urbanization, textile mills. And the, the, some of the public buildings are built in a monumental style. This was a gilded age that evolved into a progressive era. So you, uh, there was a city beautiful movement. And again, you can see the, the building and the growth of a synagogue is like that. And, uh, and again, Jews are participating in this. As I mentioned, the, the, the wheels are incorporated, incorporators of the building and loan association. They own an ice company, rice mill, brickyards. Uh, they help found a savings bank. Uh, business leads to civic. Uh, the, the business success uh, was, the business was the way that Jews integrated into, into their society. So when Brother Herman Wheel died, the Wheels donated a park and later added a pavilion. Uh, and this was a kind of symbolic way of showing that, you know, that, that the Jews are here to stay, that we are part of your city. Uh, there, it's a way of giving back for the reception that they had. So we start seeing Jews uh, holding public office. In 1891, Saul Wheel is elected a city alderman. Uh, Henry serves on the school board. And, remarkably as a trustee of the University of North Carolina. When Goldsboro schools are on the verge of bankruptcy, the wheels step forward to offer money uh, to keep them open. Sarah Wheel leads the drive for, the, uh, co-leads the drive for a hospital and the family donates $5,000 to build it. Uh, she's on the State Library Commission and later donates her home uh, as a public library. Mina Wheel is uh, one of the founders of the Women's Club and Head City Relief. Uh, when the Odd Fellows built their orphanage in uh, Goldsboro, it's named for Nathaniel Jacoby, who's uh, the leader of the Jewish community of Wilmington. Uh, if you look at the 1911 city directory, we see Leonel Wheel is listed as an alderman serving on virtually every city committee. Uh, Leslie Wheel is director of the Bureau of Business, which I assume is the forerunner of the Chamber of Commerce. Leopold Cohn, the butcher's son, is the chief of the fire department. A.A. A. Joseph and Nathan Wallenberger uh, are also uh, bank officers and, and uh, serving, um, serving in, uh, in the city. Uh, there is a persistent core of German Jews who remain in town, uh, are established, uh, over generations, Edwards, Wheels, Rosenthal, Settingers, but uh, uh, there's a uh, very characteristic of uh, J Jewish communities, especially in the small town south, is population turnover. Failure leads pe uh, businessmen to go and try their luck elsewhere. Success also does the same. You might hear, you might be in Goldsboro and see all the uh, mill development that's going on in Roanoke Rapids and, and relocate there. Uh, some people leave to go back to places like Baltimore because they might have children and they want to raise them in 
larger, more resourceful uh, Jewish communities. Um, and some of the early family names, such as Lehman or Heinemann, we no longer see listed in city directories. For a small town Jewish uh, community to survive, it needs to attract uh, East European immigrants. Uh, and the rise of this industrial South and urban South coincides with the emigration of two and a half million East European Jews to, uh, to the United States. With the East European immigration from 1878, uh, in 1878, there were 820 Jews in North Carolina, estimated. In 1927, that grew tenfold to 8,252. Uh, these were Yiddish-speaking, Orthodox, traditionalist Jews um, who, um, again, um, uh, in many ways replicated the German uh, Jewish experience. They came here with very, very limited means, uh, they were impoverished with uh, limited skills. Um, and what was the appeal of coming to the small town south? Well, I've done a study of Durham, um, and not of Goldsboro, but I, I don't think this would differ in any kind of way. In 1910, for example, in New York City, 73% uh, of the Jews were factory workers. Uh, they were working in sweatshops. In Durham, none were. On the other hand, in uh, New York in uh, 1910, 16% uh, of the Jews were uh, independent, uh, self-employed. Uh, in Durham, it was close to 80%. So if you came south into the small town south, you had an opportunity to live the American dream, to make something of yourself, not to be locked in a garment factory uh, uh, um, uh, working in a, in, in, in a factory. Uh, so the Jews established an economic niche in dry goods. goods. Uh, many were artisans, tailors, shoemakers. So again, the 1911 business directory of Goldsboro shows Louis Levin a having a dry goods store, Morris Feinstein's a shoemaker, uh, Morris Schrago starts out as a junk peddler. A junk peddler would go out into the countryside. Again, he had no money, no skills, and he'd gather scrap, uh, metal, broken glass, glass bottles, which we had bring to town, uh, which could be brokered and shipped up for, uh, for reuse. Um, Wolf Heilig and Max Myers, uh, two, Meyer, two Latvian immigrants, uh, peddled secondhand furniture. They put their hand furniture on the back, on their backs, carry it around and go door to door. Um, the North, and this was very typical, what was going on in Goldsboro of, of North Carolina towns. If you think about it, North Carolina has always been a place of small towns. In most, uh, in most states, if you go and look, there's a New York, an Atlanta, a Cincinnati, a Baltimore. Uh, the largest city is where you find the, whole, the core of the state's Jewish community. North Carolina has never had that. We've always been a, a place of <coughs> small towns. In 1927, there were 13 towns in North Carolina with more than 100 Jews, but there were none with as many as 1,000. Uh, in 1929, Jews were scattered in 188 towns across North Carolina, uh, concentrated in the Piedmont. So again, the small town experience uh, of Goldsboro was quite typical. Here, uh, Jews found less prejudice and more welcome and hospitality. Again, if you think about it, if you're living in Baltimore or New York or Philadelphia, you're probably living in a Jewish neighborhood or a Jewish ghetto, and your interactions are with other Jews. If you live in a small town, you're much more integrated into the uh, Christian community. Uh, and again, we see the pattern. Uh, A.M. Schrago in the 1890s, he comes down here. He starts out as a peddler in Eden Edenton. He hears about the growth of mills and factories in Goldsboro. He comes here and becomes a storekeeper and a shirt manu and a, even a briefly a manufacturer himself. Um, Wolf Heilig, will, uh, he changes his name to William Heilig. Here he is with his nephew, Mandel Cadis. Uh, they eventually opened up a secondhand furniture store uh, before, by the time of World War II, they're expanding into other communities. After World War II, they are the largest retail dealers of furniture in the United States with something like 660 stores. Uh, the Leader Brothers in 
19, Herman Leader comes from 1925. Again, it's a family chain migration. Uh, he, they immig Herman immigrates from Poland, winds up in Whiteville working for his uncle Sam Linewind, who has a store there. In 1925, he opens up a store of his own and, uh, in Whiteville and brings his brother Morris. In 1929, Morris moves and opens a second store in Clinton. 1937, he's got a store in Goldsboro, and there are uh, leader brothers. I think there were seven of them all together. They have stores in Wilson, Jacksonville, until there are about 25 of them. Uh, I love, saw a newspaper headline uh, on the leader brothers, Jewish by birth, but all American, uh, as if those two things were incompatible. And the brothers advertise, we are one of, uh, we are one of you. Uh, the family store was very, very typical of Jews. Sometimes in many communities they were called Jew stores. Uh, with the cart and wagon over there was Morris Bloom. He started out as a peddler, fell uh, ill one day. A farm family by the name of Peel nursed him back to health. He fell in love with the farmer's daughter, Lula. He took Lula to the rabbi in Wilmington who converted her to Judaism. They married. And he opened a number of stores. He seemed to have moved around quite a bit. I don't know where they wound up, but they're buried in the Willowdale Cemetery here in Goldsboro. Um, um, Leon Levine up there worked in his father's store in Rockingham. Uh, he got the idea of opening up a discount store, which he called Family Dollar Store. Uh, I think when he finally sold out, he had about 6,000 of them. Uh, the Samets, you might see them, they're in the construction company now. I love the man store in Whiteville because they printed a Jewish star on, outside on their sign and then on their advertising bag. Uh, the Jewish dry goods was typical, but uh, um, not the only enterprise that Jews pursued. Uh, Charles Corshin immigrated from Germany in 1921, settling first in Norfolk, where he worked as a car mechanic and a gas station operator. In 1933, he uh, was operating a bottling plant uh, in Goldsboro and eventually obtained the Pepsi franchise. Virtually every North Carolina town had a scrap yard. Uh, Joseph Brown arrived in 1922 from Dayton, Ohio, opened Goldsboro Iron and Metal in 1937. I guess it was his son Seymour took it over and uh, he had, under the name of Junk Brown, as he was called, built the largest scrap yard uh, in, in the state. Uh, virtually every town in North Carolina was anchored by a Jewish-owned uh, department store. Here, of course, in Goldsboro, you had H. Wheel and Brothers, but in New Bern, it was Copland, in uh, Asheville, it was uh, Lipinski's Bon Marche, in Durham, it was Kronheimer's, Ettinger's, and Wilson, Klein Lazarus in, in Raleigh. Um, Again, with this growth across the state, we, we see the uh, uh, temples are built in uh, many of these. Uh, Goldsboro was a forerunner in cathedral style, attesting to prosperity and good taste. Uh, the Goldsboro Jews, typically in the South, you would have two Jewish uh, congregations, uh, the shul or the synagogue for the Orthodox East European Jews and the temple for Reformed German Jews. Uh, Goldsboro is too small to divide, but uh, again, during this era, and the post-war years were marked by a re uh, another re religious revival in, uh, in America. Uh, an, an annex was added to uh, Oheb Shalom in memory of Saul Wheel. Um, and uh, typically, um, Goldsboro did not feel the ethnic tensions that you would see in a larger city. The Jews had to work things out themselves. So the Rabbi Meyerberg would conduct a reform uh, high holiday service at the temple, and then he would go over to the Odd Fellows Hall where the East European Jews were having an Orthodox service and lead that service. It's as if the Episcopalians and Unitarians had to, had to worship under one roof. Uh, not, ev not everything was happy for the Jews in 1915. The Ku Klux Klan uh, uh, revived again. Uh, it was anti-Semitic. Uh, there were campaigns uh, for 100% Americanism. In uh, 1924, uh, the Congress put an end to open migration. There was a lynching of Leo Frank in Atlanta in 1915. 
1925, a Jew was uh, mutilated by a Ku Klux Klan mob outside of Williamston, Williamston uh, here in eastern North Carolina. And this was the era of social discrimination when universities started to create uh, quotas. Uh, uh, there were anti-Semitic housing covenants restricting where Jews could live. Uh, it was very, uh, Jews were often excluded from civic and country clubs, certain industries as, um, such as banking and insurance were pretty much closed to Jews. But that was not the case in Goldsboro. Uh, in Goldsboro, and again, this is typical of small towns, and the South was the least anti-Semitic of American regions. In Goldsboro, Jews were founders of the country club. Even the Temple Sisterhood would have their lunches here. Uh, Jews were very, uh, were directors and officers and founders of, of banks and so on. So small town living uh, was much more um, uh, amenable to Jews. Um, the second generation, uh, and Jews were quick to acculturate uh, as Southerners. They joined the, in World War I, they uh, joined the army. The first North Carolinian to be killed in action was Arthur Bledenthal of Wilmington, who was shot down as a pilot for the Lafayette Escadrille. Uh, his brother, in fact, had married uh, Janet Wheel, so this was actually felt in this uh, particular community. Uh, there's Michael Barker there, who I think is that your grandfather, uh, who is a merchant. Again, a lot of these uh, families intermarried. Harry Schwartz was captain in 1928 of the, of the UNC uh, football team. So, um, uh, but North Carolina was also losing a lot of its younger uh, Jewish population. At a spear from a merchant's daughter in Goldsboro, she went to women's college, then to Columbia for an advanced degree, and became a pioneering professor of rural education at uh, a women's college. Albert Rosenthal uh, got an engineering degree from Columbia and became an engineer for the city of New York. Uh, Rabbi Meyerberg's, one of his daughters became a Goldsboro school teacher, but his son, one son became a rabbi, famous rabbi in Kansas City, another was a doctor in Delaware. So what was true for Goldsboro's Jews was just generally true for other uh, Goldsboro youth of their, of their class and generation. Uh, and there are articles written about the, uh, how North Carolina is losing its most talented uh, young people who are leaving. As uh, one Betty Wheel said to me, well, isn't New York more exciting than living in Goldsboro? Uh, so a lot of them left. Um, um, and again, you see that kind of uh, upward mobility, and the uh, colleges are the agency of that uh, social transformation. Um, Eli Evans uh, wrote a very famous book about Southern Jews in which he called them the provincials. But the truth of the matter is that Jews were cosmopolitans. Uh, again, Gertrude Wheel here for, uh, goes off to, is educated at, after Goldsboro Public Schools, and she, uh, a Horace Mann at Columbia University in New York, and becomes the first North Carolinian to graduate from, from Smith College. Uh, um, Jews are typically heading up north to, when they go on buying trips, or also, uh, they're acquainted with, they know the big city and big city culture. They're also of European origins. They keep in touch with their families in Germany and Eastern Europe. So they really have a cosmopolitan progressive view of the world. Uh, I could write a book about all of Gertrude Wheel's uh, activism. In fact, I did. Uh, and uh, uh, again, she was the head of the uh, Equal Suffrage Association in North Carolina, founding president of the League of Women Voters. Uh, and there was not a social or progressive cause that she was not associated with. But she was, uh, she was exceptional, but not atypical. Her cousin Lionel, for example, had patents on, uh, uh, on chemical patents on fertilizers, opened up a, a scientifically based uh, fertilizer factory, patented a machine to transplant longleaf pines. Uh, he led uh, Goldsboro to the uh, in the movement from in, uh, into the uh, city manager form of government, served on the National Municipal League and wrote a, uh, a book on uh, the city manager government. Uh, and again, um, uh, he, create, he led the Jewish War Suffrage League uh, campaign to raise funds for endangered uh, Jews after World War I in Europe. 
that became a, a national model. Uh, Leslie Wheel served for 28 years as a um, trustee of the University of North Carolina, and the 1926 yearbook was dedicated to him. So um, again, um, and we see this in other, uh, other leaders. There's Lionel Wheel, Leslie Wheel, Gertrude, uh, Nathan Berger, again, is a, is a bank president. He's a Wayne County commissioner. So again, uh, these are uh, showing Jews civic duties. Uh, the rise of the 1930s were uncomfortable years for Jews, uh, led by our own Senator Robert Reynolds, a Alien Registration Act uh, was created where any, anyone, uh, alien or immigrant, who had not yet gotten citizenship had to uh, register. Um, and we see this in, um, in Goldsboro too. Uh, Anna Gordon, who owns a Carolina shoe repair, uh, has to register as a Russian. Uh, Isidore Bernstein, a Polish Jew, uh, is working at the Leader Brothers uh, store, and he's brought in. Uh, and Rudolf Birnbaum of Austria, who's a member of the Wheel family, uh, is, uh, also has to register as an alien, uh, anti-immigrant sentiment. Uh, most of these, all, virtually all these families had relatives who were trapped in Nazi Europe, and they worked very strenuously, spent enormous amounts of money uh, sending them to try to get them out of Europe. Um, the wheel saved over a dozen fam family members. Uh, in other cases, they were far less successful. Uh, Jews demonstrated their patriotism in World War II. Um, I, this is Winston-Salem, but ev virtually every community would have a plaque honoring their boys who rushed to join the service. Uh, Goldsboro became a camp town with the opening of 1942 of the Seymour Johnson Field, um, and the town was crowded with soldiers. There was something like 2,500 Jewish soldiers in town, and the Jewish families all offered hospitality. The uh, temple was turned into a recreation center for uh, the USO for soldiers of all faith. The Jewish chaplain at uh, Seymour Johnson Field, uh, uh, Rabbi Alexander Good, his father, had been the rabbi in Kinston, uh, became one of the four uh, chaplains who was martyred with the sinking of the troop ship Dorchester. Uh, as an emblematic of their patriotism, uh, as Rabbi Tolachko on Victory in Europe Day created his own prayer book, and um, which expresses again his both his commitment to Judaism, but as well as his American patriotism. patriotism. This prayer book, by the way, is now held by the Library of Congress, and when they had an exhibit called Haven and Home commemorating 350 years of Jewish history in the United States, this prayer book was exhibited. Among the other things exhibited was a letter from George Washington to the Newport Synagogue. So Goldsboro was on the, the, the Jewish map. Um, the post-war years, as happened after uh, the Civil War and World War I, were followed by a re another religious re revival. Uh, we see new synagogues rising all across uh, North Carolina. Uh, another annex is uh, added to uh, Oheb Shalom. There's a sense that Jews felt of themselves as being North Carolina Jews as being part of an extended family. In 1921, Sarah Wheel had founded the North Carolina Association of Jewish Women, uh, the only such organization in the country, and Wheel Women served as its president. Uh, men joined B'nai B'rith, and virtually every Jewish home has one of these pictures of all the Jews gathering at Wild Acres for their, uh, every summer for their annual institute. They have their own home for the aged. And Jews joined the campaign in 1948 to create the State of Israel. Here we have Gertrude Wheel and Morris Leader uh, with Eleanor Roosevelt, who is signing a Zionist proclamation. But they all went, joined Jewish fraternities together at Chapel Hill, uh, or do even, um, and, and they all went to summer camps, so they all were, had a sense of an extended family. Uh, and this was true of the Jewish community of, uh, of Oheb Shalom. Uh, veterans returned, there, this is an era of prosperity, and Goldsboro is prospering. Uh, there's a, a growing of corn feed spawns, hog and turkey industries, furniture and tobacco plants arise. Uh, 1956, Seymour Johnson Air Force Base uh, uh, opens, 
uh, by the 1950s, there were 135 Jews here. And families like the Korshans, the leaders, the Rosenthal's, are all involved in community chess drives, uh, as well as providing Jewish leadership. Um, uh, Alan Korshan helps found the Goldsboro Arts Council, Robert Cadis, the Goldsboro Family YMCA. Where did they stand uh, when the civil rights uh, movement came along? Well, Jews had a relation like other whites with African Americans. They had nannies and cooks and housekeepers, clerks in their stores. Uh, polls show that Southern Jews tended to be more liberal than other whites, uh, but not as liberal as Northern Jews. Uh, Jewish stores catered to black trades, and very frequently Jews, Jewish store owners were the first to hire black clerks uh, or to extend credit to blacks. Um, the Jews had reason to fear. Syn bom bombs were planted at synagogues in Charlotte, Gastonia, Wilmington. There had always been this national Jewish organizations were uh, supportive of the civil rights um, legislation uh, and court cases. And, uh, and publicly identified with the cause, the number of freedom riders to come south were uh, disproportionately Jewish. Uh, there was also the case of Harry Golden, who published his Carolina Israelite newspaper in uh, Charlotte. He came to Gold, he was invited to Goldsboro to speak at the Oheb Shalom. He was a uh, outspoken, uh, he, he satirized segregation in, uh, with all of his various golden plans. Uh, Mark Dr. King was so enamored of him that he mentions golden by name in his letter from Birmingham jail. Um, Allard Lowenstein led, was a strategist for the Raleigh, desegregation of Raleigh. And the Wheel family was also extremely involved. Um, a gold, when, a, a council on, uh, when a Goldsboro biracial council was formed, Henry Wheel was among the 16 uh, who was appointed to it. Well, Gertrude was involved with the uh, Women's Goodwill Committee. Uh, she opened her house for integrated meetings, which, uh, which made a statement to the city of, of Goldsboro. Uh, Henry Wheel was active in the desegregation of the city. He um, rebuild, helped rebu rehabilitate housing. He served on the Employment Committee going from businessmen to businessmen, urging them to hire blacks, to sign a uh, non-discriminatory pledge. Um, when the city refused to build a pool in the black community, community the wheels donated Nina Wheel Park uh, and a swimming pool. Uh, in 1974, an academic interracial team came to uh, use, came to study Goldsboro as a case study of desegregation and they described the Goldsboro's desegregation was achieved because the black community was reasonable and willing to negotiate. And they heard from a number of people that it was the influence of a prominent Jewish family, descendants of one of the town's founders, uh, that helped uh, usher in uh, desegregation. Uh, the prosperity did not last. Uh, Jews in uh, communities in small mill and market towns have been challenged. Uh, first, uh, tobacco and, uh, was hit by uh, anti-smoking campaigns. Cotton and textile uh, was devastated by uh, foreign competition. And then there had been an emptying out of a white flight into suburbs, and downtown started to deteriorate. And the independent small businessman could not compete with box stores and shopping malls. Uh, so where are Jews now, and what's the prospect for them in the future? Well, if we look at what's going on now, we see, as I said, that uh, uh, in, the, in these old New South Mill and Market communities have, that have not made the transition into post-industrial uh, economy, their Jewish communities are dying or, uh, or declining. So we see synagogues closing in Tarboro, Rocky Mount, Wilson, Lumberton, Jacksonville, Weldon, Goldsboro. But there's a new synagogue, in relatively new synagogue in Greenville. OK, what does Greenville have that Goldsboro doesn't have? All right, so where do we see uh, the towns that in 1968, a new wor word came into our vocabulary, Sunbelt. So we see Jews are growing in college towns, such as Greenville, Boone, Chapel Hill, all have new synagogues, and high-tech medical centers. Uh, Charlotte, uh, Durham, Asheville, Greensboro, Raleigh, the Research Triangle area, and retirement centers. 
uh, the Jewish population is demographically aging. And also in exurbs, Jews, like everyone else, can't necessarily afford to live in Raleigh and Charlotte anymore, so we see Jewish congregational developments in places like uh, Concord, Matthews, Davidson, Morrisville. Uh, and again, uh, this, this is taking place when there's a demographic shift going on in American Jewry. Uh, a previous generation, most Jews were involved as managers or storekeepers in retail trades. Now a small majority are actually in the professions. They're artists, engineers, lawyers, scientists, doctors. So they're moving to places where they can find uh, economic opportunity. Uh, we all know Mandy Cohn now. She's become the symbol uh, of our uh, COVID response. There are six North Carolina Nobel Prize winners. Three of them are, are Jews. Um, and again, with that, we see a rise of temples, uh, new, new synagogue construction. There's probably close to 50 Jewish congregations in North Carolina. Uh, Goldsboro was unable to sustain that. Uh, by the 1970s, uh, it had its last full-time rabbi. The Sunday school expired without young families in town. Uh, and finally, the congregation closed. And as David said, has become uh, be, uh, uh, find, found new uses as a, uh, as a, as a soap, soup uh, kitchen. Um, and uh, again, uh, if we want to see what's going on uh, in the hope of, of Goldsboro, again, you can see first it was the railroad that brought Jews down as, as a mill and market town. Then it developed a commercial center, developed on the automobile. And now we're seeing the incipient stages somewhat belatedly of, uh, of Goldsboro as a, um, a revival of the downtown. And downtowns are being rebuilt now all across the country, literally, and certainly in North Carolina, not as commercial and retail centers, but as cultural, uh, um, cultural and entertainment centers. Okay, now you go downtown not to buy a pair of shoes or uh, to do business. You go downtown to get a good meal, uh, to uh, have a drink at a craft brewery, to visit some art galleries, to go to a festival. That's why we have art in the streets. Uh, and Jews have been very prominent in this. Virtually all these revived downtowns are centered around an arts center. Okay, people go there, when you go down there to watch music or dance or theater, then you go out and you have a meal, you go to a nice restaurant, you have meet friends and have a drink at the bar. And also, uh, we see that, for example, with the wheels, David Wheels uh, uh, being one of the inspirers of the uh, leaders in creating the, the Paramount, uh, old, after the Paramount Theater burned down into a, a transformation into an art center. And, and again, we see, for example, in Charlotte, it's the Blumenthal family. And also medical centers. Uh, again, the Brody family, another Jewish mercantile family, who uh, endowed the Brody School of Medicine, but uh, it used to be factories were the leading uh, employer in a town. Now, in many towns, such as Durham, it's, it's, it's the hospital. So uh, again, this is, um, what, what is the future in Durham? I know we just had a little conversation this morning and people are sk skeptical, they doubt that the Jewish community here will, will ever revive again, but I'm not so sure. Um, you know, as, as Goldsboro reinvents itself and creates uh, opportunities, it'll be looked upon uh, increasingly as maybe a, a, a nice place to live. New economic uh, opportunities will be created. If you get a, a, a retirement village here, some new industry comes in, high-tech industry uh, or a medical center, uh, you might see its, its Jewish community uh, start, start reviving. Uh, Jews have always been called the uh, ever-dying people, but they never, ever seem quite to die. Uh, thank you. Um, if you're more interested, I invite you to um, look over our uh, Jewish Heritage North Carolina uh, um, uh, website uh, to find out more information about the Jews of, of North Carolina. And I'll acknowledge our photos. Thank you. Hope I haven't gone on too long. <laughs> Are there questions or any comments or?
We'll um, take some time for questions and so that our virtual participants can hear as well. If you have a question, I'll pass the mic to you. Come on, don't be shy. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I have a question. <laughs> yes. Can you speak a little bit, um, very briefly, on the role of Jewish women in philanthropic organizations in Goldsboro? Uh, yeah, as I um, mentioned, the first thing that's uh, well, the second thing that happens in uh, communities is ladies' aid societies. And um, uh, uh, from the uh, Hebrew ladies' aid society, uh, um, um, Mina Wheel and a number, and uh, Sarah Wheel, uh, all became uh, instrumental in creating a ladies' aid society, an interfaith ladies' aid society that took over for philanthropy uh, uh, for the town. Um, uh, one of the things that, uh, when Sarah Wheel established the North Carolina Association of Jewish Women in 1921, um, she, um, uh, and Gertrude served three times as his president, uh, she was, uh, they were insistent not only in serving the Jewish community, but bringing in community value, of, uh, 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 ser serving the larger community and creating uh, inter interfaith uh, relations. So um, uh, Gertrude's grandmother, Eva Ettinger Rosenthal, had first lived in Wilson, and she was known uh, along with uh, Mary Daniels, who was the mother of Josephus Daniels, and um, I can't remember the other woman, uh, O'Connor, her first name, it was a Catholic Methodist Jew, and they were known as the Three Graces of Wilson. Uh, and they took over philanthropy for the, for the town of Wilson. So there had been this uh, family tradition of Jewish um, philanthropy uh, for, for the larger community. Uh, and Jews were instrumental in establishing um, organizations like the Goldsboro, um, uh, the Goldsboro uh, Garden Club, the library, the hospital. Um, I've got two virtual questions as well. I'm going to move away from the speakers here. So one of our virtual participants is asking, what is the Jewish population like in Goldsboro now? Uh, well, last I heard it was seven. Is it, is it more or less now? Might be 10, or the, well, that's a 30% increase. So um, as I said, that holds hope for the future. Uh, but again, it's, you know, do the comparison, see what's going on in Greenville, uh, where they have a temple that has a both reform and conservative affiliation because of the, uh, the community growth. And you see what, you, you know, what needs to happen in Goldsboro in order for Jewish communities to, to, to grow. I have another virtual question. To what extent, if any, did Jews in North Carolina relinquish their heritage, AKA the crypto Jews of the early Spanish New World settlements? I, I couldn't hear the second part of it. Um, to what extent, if any, did Jews in North Carolina relinquish their heritage, such as the experience of the crypto Jews of early Spanish New World settlements? Uh, it wasn't so much, um, Certainly, there, you know, you go to a town and you say, oh, there were 150 Jews 20 years ago or 30 years ago, and there's only 10 now. They must have assimilated and, or converted or done something. But uh, generally, um, I mean, J J Judaism, being Jewish, is, uh, the, the meaning of that changes over time, and Jews have, have acculturated. Uh, we don't so much use the term assimilate now. We use the term acculturate. Uh, in other words, they retain their Jewish identity, but they may not express it. Uh, all religions, we were just talking about this before the lecture, are being challenged now, churches as well as, 
as synagogues. There's a great secularization going on in American society. But uh, still there is, I think, a strong uh, 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 a Jewish identity. When they do uh, surveys and polls, um, Jews are increasingly describing themselves as, quote, just Jewish, rather than defining them in religious terms. It's, it's as if it were their identity, their ethnicity, uh, just as you might be an, an Italian or a Latin American, rather than uh, describing it in terms of a, a creed or of a, a, or of a faith. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't say so much that they've relinquished their identity as much as it's been transformed. And I think part of the issue is uh, in towns like Goldsboro, um, Eli Evans very famously said that uh, uh, Jewish fathers built businesses for sons that didn't want them. Uh, and I don't think that that was so much true as in very many cases, and I heard this over and over again when I asked that question and they would tell me, uh, no, my father, my parents didn't want me to spend the lives, that, live the lives that they did working in a store in a small town uh, where six days a week for eight and 10 hours a day, they want me to do other things. So uh, our youth has left when you go and look you know, where's the next generation of Jews in Goldsboro? Well, you'll find the Cadiz brothers in Raleigh, you'll find them in Atlanta, you'll find them in Charlotte, Chapel Hill, you'll find them uh, moving on. Uh, so um, I don't think it's so much a question that they relinquished their heritage or their living secretly. Yes, sure, there was a lot of inter, you know, intermarriage where Jews would assimilate into, uh, even in, certainly in places like Goldsboro, into the Christian community. But uh, it, it, it's mostly, uh, uh, as I said, this kind of uh, acculturation. Um, yes? Let me grab you the mic. There you go. mentioned uh, early on the symbolism of, I'll use the term symbolism, uh, of Jew as religion versus race. Yes. Would you comment on that, please? Yeah, increasingly, uh, usually a after the Enlightenment, Jews were seen as being members of a race rather than a religion. For, uh, in 1877, there was a very famous case where the Jewish banker in New York, Joseph Seligman, tried to go into a hotel, uh, a Hilton hotel, a hotel in Saratoga, and was denied admission. And uh, Conrad Hilton uh, made a very famous statement, I have no objection to Jews as a religion, I have an objection to Jews as a race. And the race came into question, uh, is the Jew white, was a question that was asked. And the great defender in North Carolina of the Jews was Governor Zebulon Vance. And his most famous, uh, he was a, uh, our Civil War governor and then um, uh, US Senator, and he was nationally one of the most distinguished speakers on the Chautauqua circuit in the days when uh, idea of entertainment was to go and hear a lecture. And his most famous speech was called The Scattered Nation, which was defense of Jews as a race. And, uh, and if you read it now, it's embarrassing to read. It, it, it's, it's racial gibberish, uh, although the Jews at the time loved it. Uh, you know, he called Jews our spiritual fathers, our wondrous kinsmen. But he had some anthropology there that kind of located the Jews between the, you know, the, the, the Northern Europeans, the Anglo-Saxons, and the African Americans in terms of the you know, people were measuring skulls and so on. So with the rise of modern science, there was increasingly emphasis on Jews as a race rather than as a religion. Thank you. Okay, we've got a few more questions here. Oh, all right. Someone over here? Okay. Let me get you the mic. Yes, sir. So I was wanting to know what, because you talked a lot about 
um, the influence of the Wheel family throughout, uh, especially Goldsboro history, and that there's been a lot of uh, a lot of young people in the Jewish community leaving Goldsboro for other opportunities. Is there anything that you think, any sort of resource or, um, I guess, something, I don't know, agriculture or, um, or the arts or something like that, is there something like that that Goldsboro could tap more into to draw more young people to stay in this area? Yeah, Do you think that there's anything in particular that kind of speaks out? Yeah, a absolutely. I know, I mean, I, uh, I live in Chapel Hill, and I mean, I know in earlier generations, uh, the kids couldn't wait to get out of town. They all headed up to New York, to Baltimore, and so on. Now they're all coming back. Uh, you know, my kids lived in uh, Washington and New York, Brooklyn, you know, hipster heaven, and now they're all coming back to North Carolina. Uh, so one, we have, uh, you have to create economic opportunities because you have to live in a place where you can make a living. And especially if you're going off and getting educated and learning skills, you, 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 know, you, need, you need those opportunities. Uh, the second thing is, is quality of life. I mean, look what's happened. I haven't been to Kinston lately, but I know what Vivian Howard has done, for example, in opening up a restaurant. It's become a culinary center. People make destination trips there. Uh, bars start opening and so on. And you can start seeing that happening in, in Goldsboro now. I think in Goldsboro has just been a little bit belated, but you have an art center and that's going to start drawing families in and, and uh, artists and, and, and younger people. And you'll start seeing uh, people will look and say, hey, why do I need to live in Cary where I can't afford to live when I could live in Goldsboro? They have a theater here, there's music here. There's a great bar to hang out and uh, it's happening in Rocky Mount now, for example, I understand. Uh, so again, that certainly could be the future of Goldsboro. Uh, a lot of it depends upon you know the leadership that you have in in your town uh, to imagine that you know to as they say have those kinds of aspirations and visions. Thank you so much. We had another question over in this area. Somebody. All right, and then we have a one on virtual. We'll grab as well. So how difficult was it for people, especially um, Jewish people 100 years ago, to keep a kosher diet in the South? Uh, probably easier than it was is today. There's two <laughs> things. Um, one, they, um, as a fellow in Durham said about rabbis back then, um, I don't know about Rabbi Meyerberg, but you know, the rabbi back then, uh, he, married, he uh, circumcised you, he married you, he buried you, and he killed your chickens. So uh, usually there was someone in town who had the ritual skill to be able to kill a kosher chicken. And there was a Rabbi Rubenstein in um, Raleigh. He was what's called a shocket, a ritual slaughterer. And he had a route that would take him around uh, eastern North Carolina and the Jewish community would buy a cow or two and leave it with a local farmer, and he would come and he would slaughter the cow, do a ritual slaughter, so he'd have kosher meat. And then also with the railroad trains and the buses, uh, they would get kosher supplies uh, from Baltimore. Uh, uh, you know, as I said, it, you know, it wasn't the, the route between Goldsboro and Baltimore. It wasn't just, you know, Goldsboro, they were sending cotton north, and that same cotton was coming back south as finished goods. So a lot of these Jewish merchants were brokering cotton, speculating cotton, which they would send north. But it wasn't just money and merchandise and business that was going back and forth. Also, mother-in-laws, matzah, you know, kosher food. Uh, I've heard numerous, I mean, I heard one fellow told me a story. He used, every time he was up in uh, Baltimore, he'd come back with a barrel of herring. And one time the herring barrel started to leak and the conductor, <laughs> uh, the fish started to rot and the conductor threw it off the train. So, uh, but, uh, and you know, I think this actually, not, not so much for kosher food, which you, 
can get at Trader Joe's now and some supermarkets, but, but um, um, uh, uh, even, even to the later days when people would go to Baltimore or New York, the Jewish people, they would come back loaded with corned beef and bagels and rye bread, uh, all the Jewish delicacies. But you could uh, very frequently, you know, a bus might ar ar uh, arrive uh, with a box of, in, in, um, in ice, packed in ice, uh, uh, filled with uh, kosher meat. And we have one more virtual question, and then I think we'll, we'll close if we don't have any more questions from the audience. Anyone? Um, so the virtual question is a good one to end on, because we end where we began. The story of Joachim Gans seems to be a revelation. Thank you for your research that has brought attention to him. Is he recognized and celebrated in North Carolina? Who is that? Uh, Joachim Gans. Oh, Joachim Gans. Joachim Gans. Uh, increasingly so. Um, two, two years ago, I guess it was, in the summer, uh, a state highway historical marker was dedicated uh, in Roanoke, uh, on Roanoke Island. Uh, and it says, uh, you know, he was often regarded as the very first scientist to come to uh, America, and he's identified as a Jewish native of Prague in the Czech Republic. I always like to think of Joachim Gans as a predecessor of the Jewish migration uh, into North Carolina. One, he was a native of the Czech, what is now the Czech Republic. Uh, he had immigrated to England and then come to America, so he was highly mobile. Uh, again, this was true of the later immigrants. He was a professional among the sailors and settlers and farmers and so on who first came here. Uh, he was obviously a, a scientist. He built the Nassayers. He was sent here to find precious metals. Uh, and he was also isolated as a Jew. Uh, we know he was Jewish because when he we went back to England, he got into a religious argument with a ship's carpenter. Uh, and he asked, what need hath God for a son? Uh, and a clergyman uh, was summoned and who talked to him in Hebrew, and he repeated that, and he was arrested for blasphemy and put into prison, and he confessed at the time that he was a, uh, a, a, a Jew, a, a non-converted, circumcised Jew. Um, so he's, um, he's been, in, if you go to the uh, National uh, Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia, they have a timeline up there of American Jewish settlement in, the, in America. And the very first listing on that timeline is 1585. Joachim Gantz arrives in Roanoke Island. So he's, he's recognized. All right. Any more questions, or shall we close here? Anything? Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, before you all scatter out. We do have some resources on the table at the front, including some links to our digital exhibits that we've just launched and some material on display. So I'd encourage you to check that out as you leave um, and take some time to visit. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you.